Non-Euclidean Geometry by Roberto Bonola Chapter 1. The Attempts to Prove Euclid's Parallel Postulate Section 10. The Parallel Postulate During the Renaissance and the 17th Century The critical work of the preceding geometers is sufficient to show the historical development of our subject in the 16th and 17th centuries, so that it would be superfluous to speak of the other able writers, such as, for instance, Oliver of Bury, 1604, Luca Valario, 1613, H. Saville, 1621, A. Take, 1654, A. Arnold, 1667. However, it seems necessary to say a few words on the question of the position which the different commentators on the elements allot to the Euclidean hypothesis in the system of geometry. In the Latin edition of the elements, 1482, based upon the Arabian text by Campanus, 13th century, this hypothesis finds a place among the postulates. The same may be said of the Latin translation of the Greek version by B. Zamberti, 1505, of the editions of Luca Pacciolo, 1509, and Nicola Tartaglia, 1543, of Commandino, 1572, and of G. A. Borelli, 1658. On the other hand, the first printed copy of The Elements in Greek, Basel, 1533, contains the hypothesis among the axioms, Axiom 11. In succession, it is placed among the axioms by F. Candala, 1556, C.S. Clavio, 1574, Giordano Vitale, 1680, and also by Gregory, 1703, in his well-known version of Euclid's work. To attempt to form a correct judgment upon these discrepancies do more to the manuscripts handed down from the Greeks than to the aforesaid authors, it will be advantageous to know what the meaning the former gave to the words postulates and axioms. First of all, we note that the word axioms is used here to denote what Euclid in his text calls common notions. Proclus gives three different ways of explaining the difference between axioms and postulates. The first method takes us back to the difference between a problem and a theorem. A postulate differs from an axiom as a problem differs from a theorem, says Proclus. By this we must understand that a postulate affirms the possibility of a construction. The second method consists in saying that a postulate is a proposition with a geometrical meaning, while an axiom is a proposition common both to geometry and to arithmetic. Finally, the third method of explaining the difference between the two words given by Proclus is supported by the authority of Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC. The words axiom and postulate do not appear to be used by Aristotle exclusively in the mathematical sense. An axiom is that which is true in itself, that is, owning to the meaning of the words which it contains. A postulate is that which, although it is not an axiom in the foresaid sense, is admitted without demonstration. Thus, the word axiom, as is more evident from an example due to Aristotle, when equal things are subtracted from equal things, the remainders are equal, is used in a sense which corresponds, at any rate very closely, to that of the common notions of Euclid. Whilst the word postulate in Aristotle has a different meaning from each of the two to which reference has just been made, Hence, according as one or the other of these distinctions between the words is adopted, a particular proposition would be placed among the postulates or among the axioms. If we adopt the first, only the first three of the five postulates of Euclid, according to Proclus, have a right to this name, since only in these are we asked to carry out a construction, to join two points, to produce a straight line, to describe a circle whose center and radius are arbitrary. On the other hand, postulate 4, all right angles are equal, and postulate 5, ought to be placed among the axioms. Again, if we accept the second or third distinction, the five Euclidean postulates should all be included among the postulates. In this way, the origin of the divergence between the various manuscripts is easily explained. 
To give greater weight to this explanation, we might add the uncertainty which historians feel in attributing to Euclid the postulates, common notions, and definitions of the first book. So far as regards the postulates, the gravest doubts are directed against the last two. The presence of the first three is sufficiently in accord with the whole plan of the work. Admitting the hypothesis that the fourth and fifth postulates are not Euclid's, even if it is against the authority of Geminus and Proclus, the extreme rigor of the elements would naturally lead to the later geometers to seek in the body of the work all of the propositions which are admitted without a demonstration. Now the one which concerns us is found stated very concisely in the demonstration of Book I, Proposition 29. From this, the substance of the fifth postulate could then be taken and added to the postulates of construction or to the axioms according to the views held by the transcriber of Euclid's work. Further, its natural place would be, as this is Gregory's view, after Proposition 27, to which it enunciates the converse. Finally, we remark that whatever be the manner of describing the verbal question raised here, the modern philosophy of mathematics is inclined, generally, to suppress the distinction between postulate and axiom, which is adopted in the second and third of the above methods. The generally accepted view is to regard the fundamental propositions of geometry as hypothesis resting upon an empirical basis, while it is considered superfluous to place statements, which are simple consequences of the given definitions, among the propositions. Non-Euclidean Geometry, a Critical and Historical Study of Its Development. This book was written by Roberto Bonola, professor in the University of Pavia. It was published by the Open Court Publishing Company, Chicago, 1912, and is now in the public domain. Read by Jim Renholt, with programming and illustrations by Jim Renholt, 2019. Thank you for listening.